Well, hi, thanks for tuning in and listening and watching this presentation about Stellaris RNA Fish, a precise method to detect, localize, quantify RNA in situ. My name is Hans Johansson. I have one of the senior scientists on the team developing this uh, technology and turning it into products that you can use. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit about the, the company that is hosting this technology, it's LGC. Um, it is a company that is working for with science to make the world a safer place. Um, we operate in, in the life sciences business with measurements and testing, and we are hosting in several different companies in standards, genomics, laboratory management services, and until recently also in forensics and security. Science and innovation is an integral part of the company and how we operate. The markets, international life sciences, measurements, and testing solutions. That means we have products and services that help um, our customers with the their experiments and uh, also making sure that they can provide their customers quality pharmaceuticals. We also help out in agriculture, biotechnology, the food business, of course many government and academic institutions, some security and some sports medicine. A little bit less now with forensics having been spun out. But let me tell you about the genomics division a bit more, because this is where we operate with the RNA fish. It really centered about nucleic acid chemistry. All we do has to do with chemistry and nucleic acids. We understand and we make CPGs, advanced CPGs, that is the controlled pore glass on which the oligonucleotides are um, synthesized. We have instrumentation that's dedicated and developed especially for this advanced oligonucleotide synthesis. We're experts in dye chemistry and especially as it relates to oligonucleotide chemistry. Our dyes work together with the nucleic acids that we manufacture. So these advanced oligos, they go into different applications, primarily into qPCR, SNP detection, but also now into RNA fish. On top of that, we have a robust custom oligosynthesis manufacturing. So if you have any oligos that you need made, you should talk to us. A little bit more about the products and the services then. So the RNA fish product and Stellaris, so-called, contains probe sets, controls, and buffers. The qPCR, we have several different types of probe sets. Um, uh, probe types that will then help you interrogate even difficult sequences. The custom oligos can be delivered to you as plates with all kinds of different modifications, whatever you need to use them for. We also scale up for GMP and commercial services, so laboratory developed tests, light specific reagents, and meter diagnostics, large scale on Pilot DX. And we will also package, and together with our quality measurement system, we will provide you the reagents that you need. On top of that, or rather, underpinning all of that, is all the synthesis reagents that we pro provide. Our dyes, our phosphoramidides, our CPGs, supports, columns, and last but not least, we're taking all of this into therapeutics and making preclinical oligonucleotides for testing. But more about the RNA fish. This is why you're here. So let's, let's get excited about the RNA fish. RNA is really the central part of the central dogma. It's right in between the DNA and the protein. It functions in many different ways, not just as an intermediate towards becoming a template for the RNA production. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
So the question is, which RNA we want to look at? There are many ways to get there. The microRNAs is one example. Sorry, microarrays is one example. But of course, RNA sequencing is taking over and providing a very fine detail on which RNAs are expressed in which cell. But where is it? Okay, where is it the RNA expressed? Where in the tissue? So now we're looking at single cell detection. We can um, compare the expression of different genes and proteins at different time points in different tissues. But how much is it expressed? That's the other question. And these are, of course, data you can amass with qPCR, the other products that we provide. But it will only tell you how much in the tissue, not how much in a particular cell or where in the cell. So let me show you a little movie here. Um, so this movie is available on our website. It describes you a little bit of the detail what we can actually do. I'm fortunate we'll have to skip that and go on to the actual method instead. I can describe exactly what's in the movie anyway. So. The method is pretty simple. You take a cell, or thousands, or a piece of tissue, permalize it, uh, that is poking holes in it with any of many different methods. Uh, we have two methods on the website that is available to you, especially for the adherent cell lines. And then you take our probes, pretty simple. The oligonucleotides, singly labeled, that together will anneal to the messenger RNA in the cell and provide a spot that is visible under wide field fluorescence microscopy and shows up as a diffraction limited spot, which means that all spots are pretty much the same size. And then you can quantify and calculate and understand differences between the different cells and the probes and the targets. But let's um, talk a little bit more about what you're going to look at, because remember there are many different RNAs. There may even many different RNAs coming out from the same gene. So the example at the bottom is your favorite or everybody's most known gene, the gap th turns out it doesn't just encode for one messenger RNA, but four different ones. So we can produce either inclusive probe sets or exclusive probe sets. The inclusive probe sets are ones that will take care of detection for all the different variants. So these would be focused on the right-hand side, the three prime exons of the gap TH. An exclusive probe set would be a probe set that only recognizes a specific exon or subset of exons. Those would be the ones to the left of the gap TH. In general, we um, recommend using the RefSeq database at the NCBI as a sorting point. And those are the NM numbers you can see below. We recommend using the coding sequence, partly because it's the most uh, GC balanced normally and also because it uh, is not provide you know, binding sites for proteins like the 3 prime UTR normally does. So you can design, you can choose which exons to design your probe sets against. If you are going to do an intron probe set, we recommend avoiding the last intron because that often is spliced away out away from the cytotranscription. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So what do you need to image? The image shows here a wide field microscope that we have in the lab. Um, it's one standard setup with a set of filters appropriate to match our, our dyes. We can also match your filters with our dyes as we have several different dyes. On the right you can see five dyes that we provide, fluorescein, quasar 570, quasar 670, Psi-3 and Psi-5 analogs, and calflow red 519 and 610, which are rhodamine analogs. 
So a pretty sensitive camera, and on this microscope we see a cold CCD, but a CMOS will also work. A metal halide lamp, that or a very strong LED will also work. And it is amazing how fast the microscopy field is advancing. You are in a good time if you're going to start looking at the RNA fish with low signals. So let me briefly touch on how we would verify a probe set to make sure that the oligos that are in the set will bind to the target that you expect and produce a signal that you would expect. We have spent a lot of time with a, a human cell line, the A549 alveolar lung cancer cell line. It's a male cell line, which means that it has all different genes, all different uh, genes are in, in the human. It is hypotriploid, uh, which means that for this particular case, the 8Q24 locus is represented four times. It becomes important in the next couple of slides here. It's a flat cell line, it's a low background fluorescence, and it's pretty easy to culture. So then we proceed to the two color validation. And on the image on the right, we have the PVT1 long non coding RNA as an example. This is a nuclear long non coding RNA that is produced from all four loci in the cell line. And you can see pretty strong signals that are large punctae in, in the nucleus. They're associated with the gene, and I'll show you how we know that in a minute. You can also see some smaller spots, which are individual PVT1 long encoding RNAs. The point I want to make with this slide, though, is that we can use two different probe sets that target half of the PVT1 and the other half of the PVT1 in two different colors. Now, we should see two different signals in the fluorescence microscope and they should be overlapping, and that's exactly what we see. Now you may ask, why are they next to each other? That would be done actually on purpose, to segregate the two different signals and by two pixels to the right and one down. <laughs> so you can see that they're actually exactly overlapping. If this doesn't work, if your cell line doesn't express your target, well, you can find another cell line. You can alter the expression, so you induce the expression with a known indu inducer, you can transfect the cell line with a plasmid that, trans that would express your, your protein or RNA of interest. And you can use um, RNAi or SHRNI to downregulate your RNA to see that it disappears. And of course, you can sequence your sample. Another way to verify that you have the correct probe set is to combine immunofluorescence and fish. An example on the left uses an antibody against the speckles, the anti scc 35 antibody, and mallet one RNA probe set. And you can see a stunning co localization of the two different uh, macromolecules. And on the right is the, the same uh, long non coding RNA validated in a third way. This time we know that the MALAT1 expression follows the cell cycle. So we've added a cell cycle marker. And this time it's the CDKN1A RNA. CDKN1A, of course, encodes the P21 uh, cell cycle protein. And we see a strong correlation between the expression of the CDKN1A messenger RNA and the MALAT1 RNA. So how do you get these images and how do you get numbers out of them? There are a couple of different uh, types of soft software out there. The one we recommend first would be the Star Search, which is hosted by Arjun Raj at the University of Pennsylvania. We also have developed in-house ImageJ and Fiji macros. FishQuant has become a more of a user-friendly software in the last couple of years, and so you may want to check that out too. But there are many, many others there. And so depending on how your microscope is set up, you may want to just try it out first. What it does is take the images, 
z-stack of images, which means that you can actually differentiate two spots that are on top of each other, and therefore get an accurate 3D count. You take your image, you circulate the uh, different cells, one, two, three, and then the software will count the number of spots within those cells and plot them, the spot intensity and the spot width. And therefore you will see that if you have any off-target binding or any autofluorescent feature, it will stand out in this plot and you can take it away. Okay, what's different about Stellaris RNA fish? Well, number one is it's that it is a method that does not employ any signal amplification. So the signal you get is by the collective binding of single, uh, singly labeled fluoro, single fluorophore labeled oligonucleotides. And together, 25 unique probes on one messenger RNA gives you a very clean signal. One oligobinding of site is invisible, which means that there are very few false positives. Missing one or two oligonucleotides, you still get a strong signal, which means there are very few false negatives. This is very different from other technologies that will employ various amplification methods. The one on the right mimics a Christmas tree, and building a large Christmas tree on only on two oligos, with the risk for fairly large um, uh, spots that are not uniform in intensity. So, better, not brighter. The technology is very simple, which means that you do not need to purchase any extra equipment for your lab. You don't need any specific hybridization ovens. The method is fast, and you can do this in one day. You can multiplex it. I can go on, but let's continue instead to show an example of the multiplexing we can do. And this time, we're looking at a major oncogene. The HER2 oncogene is responsible for the majority of breast cancers. The cell line that we are showing here is one of the more aggressive breast cancer cell lines. It expresses the HER2 protein and the HER2 mRNA from a highly amplified gene. The genome in the SKBR3 cell line contains up to 20 semi-stably <laughs> expressing HER2 genes. And you can see a very large spots in the nucleus, together with a large number of single molecules in the cytoplasm. These are translated, and the protein they produce, um, you can then image with a HER2 antibody. And it's shown where we expect it at the cell surface, and that's shown in pink. If you want to learn more about combining immunofluorescence and RNA fish, we have a benchtop video that is available at BioCompare. So I mentioned a couple of nuclear RNAs, and I want to emphasize that it is appropriate for most long non-coding RNAs. There is a cutoff in size. We recommend 25 oligonucleotides depending on what the expression occurs. And as you know, if you've been studying long non-coding RNAs, many of them contain repeats and or sequences from um, line elements or allo sequences. And those are, of course, not appropriate if you want to uh, perform single molecule on the detection. However, the two examples here, a neat one and a mallet one, are quite long, several KB long, actual 10 and 30 nuclei, KB long RNAs, and they're very easy to detect. Neat one forms the basis for the paraspeckles, very large structures in the nucleus, and mallet one, the speckles that are surrounding the paraspeckles, all involved in the splicing machinery, maintenance, and recruitment, and are therefore highly expressed in proliferating cells and as such are good markers for proliferation 
and it turns out that an upregulation of NEAT1 and MALT1 is also associated with the malignant lung cancers. So the multiplexin doesn't just go to RNA and protein, to, to RNA and protein, but it goes to RNA and RNA. Because the oligonucleotides are the same size in each probe set, they will bind with about the same affinity. So that there is there is complete compatibility between different probe sets. In this example, we're looking at the human endothelial growth factor receptor mRNA, the large subunit of the RNA polymerase 2, and topwise polymerase 1. Three mRNAs, two of the proteins are nuclear, one of the protein is on the cell surface. Well, that doesn't matter where the protein is. Where's the RNA? Well, they're all messenger RNAs, so they should be in the cytoplasm, and yes, they are. We can also see quite large transcription bursts, that is nuclear explosions, what we call it, in the in the nucleus for the EGFR mRNA. If you look at the image on the left, you can also see that the EGFR mRNA is hugging the nucleus. It is actually associated with the endoplasmic reticulum. And how do we know that? Well, I'll show you in it in the next couple of slides here that the FISH technology can also be used for subcellular localization of RNAs. RNA detection, you, know, you should have figured that out by now. We know where there's RNA. We know how much the RNA is. We can actually count it. You know that too. In some cells, you also seen, and I repeat that here, you can see the, the genes firing. So, the transfer receptor messenger RNA is also an RNA encodes for a protein that shuttles in and out of the cell. Mostly it's found on the outside of the cell, collecting transferrin and bringing iron into the cell. The RNA is associated with endoplasmic reticulum. T4C has a signal sequence. The signal sequence is recognized by the signal recognition particle that brings the messenger RNA and the ribosomes to the ER and transfers the protein into the ER. So, co-localization of the TFRC messenger RNA, together with the 7SL RNA, which is the major component, the, what the only RNA component known of the signal recognition particle, should show you where the transferrin receptor RNA is, and correctly so, it co-localizes to the endoplasmic reticulum. That's that what you can see on the right. Other fun things we can do with RNA fish. We can check the mRNA expression. We can make sure that the siRNA or the shRNA that we're employing in the lab has the specificity we expect. So on th this example, we have the uh, hypoxia induced, induced factor alpha, HIF1 alpha, uh, this mRNA in our favorite cell line again, has about 60 plus minus 20 um, messenger RNAs per cell. Up a knockdown with shRNA after 24 hours, there are about nine spots left. And the majority of those are actually nuclear, as we would expect with an siRNA experiment. Meanwhile, the gap DH control mRNA remains the same. This correlates with the expression of the HIF1 alpha protein. And after shRNA treatment, up on hypoxia, there is no induction of the HIF1 alpha protein. So we have both an RNA experiment, a protein experiment, and they go hand in hand. We can characterize different cell lines. Here are three examples, three different breast cancer cell lines. So if you get a breast cancer cell line in your hand, so you want to know how much does it express, how is it different from the other established cell lines, what you can do, you can take the HER2 probe set that we already talked about. And you can com compare the copy number. In the upper left, you've already seen the SKBR3, which is full of mRNAs and genes expressing the HER2 mRNA in the, cell, in the nucleus. 
in B, C, and D, and B and C, have, we have two less aggressive um, breast cancer cell lines, the MCF7 and MDA MB231. And correctly so, the number of spots for HER2 in those cell lines is remarkably smaller than in the SKBR3. And of course, these cell lines are derived from tumors that are um, not expressing the HER2 protein either. On the lower right, we have a tissue sample from a HER2-positive breast cancer, as and indeed we can see a fairly high expression of the HER2 messenger RNA. Let's go back to PBT1 a little bit. And this neighboring gene, MYC. Okay, these are two actually very important oncogenes. The MYC1, the MYC messenger RNA, and the PBT1 long non-coding RNA um, are both is sitting on 8Q24, which is a region of the genome which is often amplified, and uh, therefore the copy number of these two genes is much higher. In the cell line I've been talking about, the copy number is four. So the idea here was that we could use the MYC expression to localize the PBT1 expression, and vice versa, because we know the genes are neighbors. So we made four probe sets two against MYC, one against the exons, one against the introns. Exons in green, introns in yellow. And PBT1, the same thing, but the exons in red and the introns in blue. MYC is a very simple gene. Three exons, two introns. PBT1 is a very complicated gene. The term that's developing for these um, difficult long encoding RNA genes is Baroque, where the splice patterns really are not dependent on the coding sequence and therefore much more free to, the splicing machinery is free to explore different splicing variants. And that's exactly what we see for PVT1. This gene also hosts several microRNAs, a couple of pseudogenes, and even a, a transmembrane protein RNA. So let's see what happens here. First, um, the MYC exon RNAs, the probe set that does detect single molecules of RNA in the cytoplasm. And in the blue, which is the nucleus stained with DAPI, we can see two large foci which correspond to the MYC intron probe set signal, which we can see on the right. So here we have the localization of the MYC genes. We also see a couple of other smaller spots in the nucleus that are both labeled by the MYC intron and exon sequences. And they correspond to the MYC pre-messenger RNA that has escaped the cytotranscription but hasn't been, um, where splicing hasn't finished, and therefore, therefore probably the last exon is still maintained. Note, we see no intron signal in the cytoplasm. The term ice fish is used for intron chromosomal expression, and we use that to distinguish it from Stellaris RNA, messenger RNA fish, or single molecule RNA fish, because it does not normally light up single molecules of RNA, but rather the transcription sites. Let's go to PVT1. Here we see four loci shining up, um, lighting up in, in the on the right, the PVT1 and tronic RNAs are clearly visible. We see four spots in the upper cell, and, but only three bright ones in the lower cell, which would indicate that transcription just has ceased of one of the alleles. For the exonic uh, probe set, that will pick up single molecules in the nucleus, but um, we also see a couple of them escaping into the cytoplasm. Um, maybe we want to investigate that further. Um, we would think that some of these cells may have been squished a little bit hard, too hard in, <laughs> in the process. But if you now imagine the PBT1 exon signals and intron signals as co-localized, you can do the same thing with the PVT1 intron signals and the MYC intron signals, and you can see that 
the MIC intron signal actually works as a localizer for the PVT1 in intronic RNA. And therefore, we can say that the PVT1 RNA both remains at home and leaves home. The single molecules will migrate into other localization, local lo locales in the nucleus. So this is a good way to tell whether the lone non-coding RNA acts at the site of transcription or away from the site of transcription. We've already talked about NEAT1. Well, it turns out that this gene gives rise to two variants, a long one and a short one. The long one terminated by an RNA's P-like motif and the short one by standard polyadenylation. The long one, as you can see from the green signals, only resides in the paraspeckles. The short one seems to be also localized around the paraspeckles, perhaps collecting RNAs for uh, processing at the different paraspeckles. One of the processes that we have recently read about is methylation of amines by ADAR, etc. Uh, we will see whether that holds up or not. Again, I want to talk to you about the two-color validation. So we can do this uh, taking half of the probe set for the short variant and half of the probe set for the short variant. Now we split that probe set into two different colors and we see for complete co-localization of the two. And that's the way we validate the probe set, and verif verify that the probe set actually picks up the correct signal. Another thing you can do with long non-coding RNAs is to examine anneal-specific expression. And of course, the, the standard for this is exist RNA, which is expressed from the inactive X chromosome in females. It also lends you the opportunity to count the number of, of X chromosomes in a cell line. The SKBR3 cell line I mentioned was uh, quite genomically unstable and uh, mutated. And in fact, it contains three copies of the X chromosome. And we can see two of them light up with the exist long non -core RNA. This takes us into a very interesting experiment that Teresa Imanishikari asked us to perform. And we successfully managed to pick out the signals from a couple of genes hosted on the X chromosome, this time in mouse. The X chromosome you denote uh, here in red is the mouse exist RNA. The question was, is the TLR8 gene expressed on both the active and the inactive X chromosome? Active and inactive. So most genes on the inactive X chromosome are inactivated. Well, it turns out that TLR8 is not. So the expression of TLR8 then, therefore, correlates with the severity of systemic lupus erythematosus and the sensitivity of females to, uh, to this disease over males. We used the EIF2S3X, a gene that is known to escape the X chromosome inactivation as a control, and we can see four signals in these two cells. We can see the EF23, EF2S3X, the TLR8, and the EXIST, and of course the DAPI. Cell line characterization, let's take that one step further. Okay, so here we have um, data that is from two different papers, or one paper and one poster. In the northern blot on the right, we examined the expression profile of EI5A1 and EI5A2. EI5A1 being a housekeeping gene for a translation factor. The 5A2 with a very limited expression normally in testis and brain. Well, it turns out that in some cancer cell lines, this is highly upregulated. And the examples that we show here is the colorectal cancer 205. The another colorectal cancer is SW480. And the ovarian cancer, UACC1598. 
and of car also in ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer. And the expression from the northern correlates extremely well with the results that we get from the Stellaris RNA fish. Extraordinary high copy number of 303 plus minus 203. Very hard to count because these cells clump up and very small, but we can still do image them in the UACC 1598. So, if you see an enhanced copy number of genes in a cell line, the question always remains, is that gene active or not? And of course, with RNA fish, you can draw that conclusion. Okay. The f 5 2 is an interesting gene for other um, reasons, too. So it's very simple. It has one, two, five exons, but its last exon is, undergoes differential polynylation. It is not quite known exactly what that means, but there are some indications that the longer forms will travel through neurons, whereas the shorter ones will not. So therefore, it's important to know which messenger RNA you're actually expressing. And we were able to do a four-color RNA fish experiment here. So we have four different probe sets, A, B, C, and D. And they will then target different regions of the messenger RNA. The A will target all four isoforms. The B, three isoforms. C, two isoforms. And D, only the longest isoform. So therefore, we should see a decreasing number of spots in the cell if we had uh, differential pollination actually occurring. If all messenger RNAs ended at the last pollination signal, we would see all four signals and all spots. This is not what we see. So it turns out that there is differential pollination. And again, we're using the standard cell line, A549. And we see about 100 spots for A, which means that it's a total of 100 spots, or 120, for all RNAs, but only 30 for the dRNA. So the bottom line here is that you can use RNA fish for differential pollination. You can use the same technique for alternative splicing. The example here is the caluminin um, messenger RNAs that are derived from the caluminin gene. There is one central exon that is differentially spliced. It is part of the EF hand binding, calcium binding protein motif in the finished protein. And you can have one or the other. At least that's what the sequencing data indicated. So we performed the triplex RNA fish, single molecule, three probe sets, one against the common sequences, an inclusive probe set, and two exclusive probe sets, targeting only exon four or exon five. Then we label those three probe sets in three different colors and perform the triplex RNA fish experiment. And we found that the overlapping signals from the common set with exon four or exon five or exon four and five and we, the preponderance of messenger RNAs contained the exon four only. The, others, the other majority was the exon five only. In some ex instances, we found exon four and five. And this is quite an unexpected until we started looking to where those RNAs are. And it turns out they're in the nucleus. So they actually are just like the transcription. So we, when we added an intron probe set, we can localize that signal to the nucleus. So these are pre-messenger RNAs that are not fully spliced. And therefore, not make it out into the cytoplasm. So in summary, about what you can do with this. So that is single molecule RNA fish. It's a versatile precision tool for DNA expression in cell biology. It has extraordinary specificity, and you can decide yourself what kind of uh, specificity you want to give your probe sets using different design filters. There are different options to verify and validate your probe sets. You can form up to quadruplex, if not higher, single molecular RNA fish. You can combine introns and exons. You can actually use the 
RNA fish as a proxy for DNA fish. Remember all of those bright foci in the SKBR3 breast cancer cell line. It's an excellent tool for validation of RNA seq data, and you can dissect different RNA variants that come from different genes. Currently, we offer this for research use only, but we are willing to partner with you to develop it for other purposes too. So, what do we actually offer? Custom probe sets, custom assays. So, these are your target genes and your RNAs that you go in and design at our website and then order with the dye that you select. The turnaround time is five to seven business days. You get five nanomoles of a pool of lyophilized oligos, and they are enough for between 80 and 400 experiments, depending on what you want to do. Chip ready probe sets, and there's actually a couple of them missing here. We have added since we made these slides. This is fantastic. We uh, have found a couple of probe sets that will target genes that are expressed in all cells that you can use as controls for your experiments. You can set up your experiments. We know they work. They're ready to deliver next day. They're sitting on the shelf. You get one animal, and we have selected the two most common dyes, Quasar 517 and 670, which correspond to Psi 3 and Psi 5. And the list is growing, so I shouldn't talk too much about that. The last uh, category is the design ready probe sets, which is a, a collection of designs that we have performed in-house. We've taken care to make sure that they are inclusive, so that you can add exclusive assets onto it if you wish. Um, they are available for over 20 organisms. Uh, they are get delivered just like the, the custom assays, as 25 nanomoles, and the turnaround time is five to 15 business days, depending a little bit on if we need to go in and double check the, the, uh, the design. And I'm showing one example here. It's FOS, the FOS oncogene that we have expressed uh, in the cell line by induction with the PMA. As a complement to these probe sets, we have the fish buffers. The buffers, uh, we thought we'd just make available as a complement, uh, easy to tell you don't have to go and remake them all the time. In that process, it turned out we found a couple of ingredients that enhance the signal, so we are very happy to provide these to you. Um, they are both hybridization buffers and the two different wash buffers. We have a couple of resources on the website, and I recommend that you take a look here and spend some time there's a lot of useful information. One of the resources is the Citation Center, where we have collected, where we collected uh, papers for the first uh, five or six years of a single molecule RNA fish. We have categorized them. We have uh, taken out the different probes, the dyes, and the organisms, and uh, broken that up into information that you can find useful. And what we found along the way is that out of these 10 or close to 600 publications that we examined. A lot of them were published in Nature's Cell and Science journals, and we are very proud of that fact that our customers are as uh, specific and precise and distinguished in, in their publication and their work as we are. I want to thank if several people here who have been working diligently to make this in a product that you can use easily to get some incredible data. Ron Cook, the founder of, LGC, of BioSearch Technologies, the former head of LGC BioSearch, uh, Darren Dick, the customer service groups, which provide you excellent technical support. Many people in the RNA groups, from fluorescence to bioinformatics to chemistry. Uh, our production groups, which have turned this into a real product that we can sell. The marketing groups who know what actually you would like to do with your product and can provide solutions for you. The sales groups that will reach out to you. And uh, our collaborators, Arjun Raj, one of the inventors of the technology at the University of Pennsylvania. Teresa Imanishikari, that I mentioned for the collaboration with the SLE experiments. Yinghe Park at the NIDCR, NIH, for the uh, EF5A experiments. And Peter Dehone 
at Leiden University for the ultimate splicing. Thank you very much for your time and please do contact us if you have any other questions.